So the premiere of Viking Season 5 came out the other day and I thought why not make this quick video looking at the historical predictions that I have for Season 5 and the future seasons of Vikings based off the trailer that they released for Season 5. So to kick it off, obviously at the end of Season 4 we had the shock horror, or the delight depending on whose side you're on, of the death of one of the main brothers of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. So the death was indeed the death of Sigurd Snake. Snake in the Eye, or Sigurd Ormar Jaugar in Old Norse. And while this happened in the show, in reality, there is no evidence that Ivar the Boneless, or Bainlausti in Old Norse, actually killed him. This is just something that the show has put in. I will probably make a video at some point about all the other inaccuracies, but in this one I'm going to address quite a few of them because it's hard to look at the history without looking at some of the inaccuracies. So while he dies in the show, in real life, in history, we don't actually know how Sigurd died. We do know that he got married and he was given parts of Denmark, uh, including Ceylant, which is quite a large area in Denmark as well as other places, and that he had a lot of offspring, some of whom would become very important later on throughout the Viking Age, right up until the Norman Conquest in England, for example, but I'll make a separate video about that. So in the next part of the trailer, a medieval-looking city being attacked by the Norse army under leadership of one or probably more of the brothers. Now, what I have to point out is that this is a depiction of the great heathen army or the store here as it was called which was just the great army although the anglo-saxon chroniclers later on started calling it the great heathen army given the pagan nature of the army that was attacking the anglo-saxons at the time now if you weren't aware in the previous season season four we saw a lot of the great heathen army in its first attacks on england which were mostly in northumbria at this point attacking king ayla who they did indeed blood eagle as we saw in the series after defeating them. However, the battle that we saw probably didn't take place, it was probably an attack on York or Aerforwich, as the Anglo-Saxons called it, which was a very important capital, capital of one of the sub-kingdoms of Northumbria called Dera, but that's besides the point. Now, here we see an attack on a big city. Now, the Great Heathen Army obviously attacked York, which I mentioned, but it probably isn't that one because Ayla was killed, uh, or not killed, sorry, captured at that battle and then later blood-eagled. So, I'm assuming this will be an attack on one of the other cities. Now perhaps this is going to be the Siege of Reading which took place in the Kingdom of Mercia. The West Saxons, so from Wessex including King Alfred, which I'll get onto later on, came to Reading with the other Mercian lords to try to defeat the Vikings, although this ended up ending badly for the Anglo-Saxons as the Norsemen came away victorious. So this scene that we might be seeing might be a scene from there or just an attack on a different city. Of course East Anglia also fell, which is when the martyrdom of King Edmund happened. He was pierced by many arrows. If you watch The Last Kingdom, that's actually the scene where um, Uhtred is watching as Ubba in The Last Kingdom, the big guy, he is ordering this King Edmund filled full of arrows um, when, when he's shot, essentially, and he says, well, if your god can really do anything, then why doesn't he save you? That's the story of St. Edmund, he became a martyr, but that's by the by. So this city scene, not sure exactly which one it'll be, it might be the Siege of Reading. Now, here we see something that I really do quite agree with. Now, the most striking thing about this, obviously, is the kind of Templar theme that they have going on, with a rather familiar scene of having the Red Cross on a white background. Now, this didn't really appear in European countries until the Crusades, and the first Crusade happened at the start of the 11th century. Now, why is this inaccurate? Well, the first ones to really start using this flag were the Genoese in Italy. And one of the reasons why this came in after the Crusades is because the Genoese were one of the big trading cities in Italy, such as Venice, for example, and they funded and helped the Crusaders get to the Holy Land by ships. And it's after that point that a lot of the Crusaders adopted this symbol. So that's why it spreads throughout Europe to, for example, through the lands of Aragon. So in the Barcelonan flag, you have this symbol. And of course, the English flag, St. George's Cross, that's the same symbol. But we are talking the middle of the 9th century with the Great Heathen Army, so this is way too early to be having this. The city-state of Genoa didn't gain independence, or the Republic of Genoa didn't come into being until at least another century and a half after this point. And as well, the type of shields that they are using simply wouldn't have been used at the time. People used round shields, both the Anglo-Saxons and the Norsemen 
both used round shields. They did not use these kind of shields, which again look at least a few centuries out of place. This looks more like a crusading kind of thing. Remember, the Normans won't be a thing for another few hundred years as we know them today with the kind of uh, the nice helmets and the kite shields, which is a slightly different shape to this. But then again, people at this point were using round shields. So a little bit of a nitpick here, and oh, backscabble alert. Now this is Heermund, who is the bishop. He was a real figure, and he actually did die in battle. Spoiler alert, of course. He died at the Battle of Malden, which was a defeat for... It was a defeat for the Anglo-Saxons at the time. Now he was fighting on the side of King Alfred, and I believe also his brother Athelred at the time, who was King of Wessex before Alfred came to the throne. But we don't actually have any real evidence that he was this way possible. Now... At this time, although Celtic Christianity was no longer being practiced throughout most of the British Isles, I think I'm correct in saying especially not in England, there were possibly warrior monks and warrior bishops among the Celtic Christian tradition. Although whether this was the thing in the Roman Christian tradition, I'm not sure. I've not come across any evidence suggesting he was a warrior bishop, although he did die in battle. Now this might just be because he was there, he was praying. This was a regular thing for armies to do to bring their holy men. Um, we see it several times even a few hundred years earlier. For example, you have the Welsh at the Battle of Chester, they had a contingent of monks, although they were all slaughtered by King Athelfrith of Northumbria. And why? Northumbria is the best! Moving on, we clearly see that the Vikings are trying to portray this kind of Odin symbolism. With here we see Ubba, one of the other sons of Ragnar. Again, Ragnar is probably a mythological figure, a legendary figure from history, compiled through what I believe to be several figures from history, rather than just one figure as he is shown in the series of Vikings. And he, Ubba, is one of these sons. And again, like I was saying, you see the clear Odin symbolism. Odin being the chief chief god at the time of the Vikings in the Viking Age and the Norse pantheon of gods and he historically has one eye because he gave the other eye for wisdom. Now Odin is a wisdom seeker and it's possible that they're trying to foreshadow that something similar as that which happened to Odin in the Norse mythology might occur to Ubba or they've just done this because it looks cool and because probably Ivar cut his eye out because it, it looks cool. You never know with Vikings whether this is some kind of deeper meaning behind it and some kind of foreshadowing or whether they've just done it because they thought hell will give him one eye because it looks cool and Vikingy. Now an interesting thing about Ubba which is why he's probably my favorite leader of the Danish army in the great heathen period if I can call it that, is his connection to Frisia and the Frisians. Now, he is recorded to history as Ubba Dux Frisonum, which meant Duke of the Frisians. And it's possible that he himself, or a large part of his army, was actually made up of Frisians, because they do indeed think that he came over to England from Frisia, where there were Danish settlements at the time, as it had been given unto the protection um, of various Danish war chiefs by the Franks. Now, of course, Frisia by the 9th century was under control of the Franks, at least the part of Frisia that um, was in the West and East Frisia at the time. Were, they were parts of the Frankish Empire and the various offshoots of that. Now, as I said, these areas were often given to the Danes who would rule over it. Now, an interesting point is whether the Frisians, the ethnic Frisians at the time, would have been happy with this or not, because it's said, it's written down that a lot of the time Frisians hadn't really converted, or they weren't sincerely converted, as in they were still doing heathen practices up until the 11th century. And obviously, the middle of the 9th century is only really a 100 years after some of the final conquests of parts of East Frisia by the Franks. So it's an interesting question whether the reason why the great heathen army isn't called the great Danish army, it's called the Mikkelherde in Old English, which means the large army or the great army, might be because it was really a mixture of Danes and Frisians, this Ubba or Ubbi the Frisian leading a Frisian contingent. Now, of course, I will make a video about this because, as you will all know, I am fascinated by the role that the Frisians played in history, which I think is largely not recorded for whatever reason. And, of course, being a Frisian myself, I do see it as slightly being my role to look into this more 
and to um, maybe en uncover some of these theories as I think the more people who know about it the more people can think about it and come up with ideas about this. But anyway, that's Ubber. I'm not entirely sure what he's going to do this season, although historically Ubber might have been one of the leaders who went on during the Great Heathen period, but not much is written down about him at the time, although later on we do know we do learn a bit more about him as potentially one of the other leaders alongside the more famous figures such as Ivar or Guthrum Bagsek uh, and Halfdan of the Wide Embrace, who, interestingly enough, isn't mentioned in Vikings, which may be an interesting point where they might give Ubber some of the role of Halfdan instead. Now this next bit in the trailer kind of annoys me because it's one of the things in Vikings that really does annoy me. The fighting, which I will look into again in a minute. And here you see, I think it's Vitzerk, which means white shirt, another one of the Viking leaders that we don't know too much about, just slashing through this very historically inaccurately depicted Anglo-Saxon warrior just by simply slashing through the back as if it was made out of paper mache. Um, it's very hard to slash through mail, practically impossible unless you, you have really terrible mail. The way to get through mail is to puncture it either with a spear, that's the reason why spears were used a lot in this time period. One, because they were cheap and effective and distance, and two, because you could potentially go through mail if you get a really good thrust and it's the puncturing action, not a slashing action. A slashing action is an awful lot weaker. Of course, if he was just wearing a shirt, a normal shirt, yes, you would go through it with an edge, but a point has a lot more force, obviously a lot less surface area and more drive behind it. This probably isn't very physics physical terminology but that's essentially behind it and in vikings you constantly see people going through mail as if it's just paper or a shirt just by slashing through it that is incredibly difficult to do um and yeah that's just one of the things that annoys me which i thought i could vent about so the next figure we see in the trailer is Harold, who was called Harold Fairhair. At this point, earlier on, he would have been called Harold Tanglehair, which is down to his story of that he was rejected by a woman. This is the historical, the myth behind him. He was rejected by a woman because she said, I will only marry the king of all Norway, which up until this point wasn't a country. It hadn't been unified yet. So he said, I am not going to comb my hair until I have conquered all of Norway. So he set himself the benchmark of conquering Norway and at this point he became known as Harold Tanglehair because his hair was of course terribly knotted. Now when he did finally manage to conquer Norway his hair had been unwashed, I think he decided not to wash it as well, unwashed and uncombed for a very long time but I think that there might actually be something in this because I have heard and I'm not sure if this is just an urban myth that if you don't wash your hair with shampoo for a long time it starts to do it naturally. I mean I think you just get dreadlocks at that stage which is a throwback to one of my older videos but I think you get you, you might get like really nice hair and at that point he combs his hair again and makes it look nice so he becomes known as Harald Farhager in Old Norse which in English is Harald Fairhair so that's the story behind his two nicknames. But anyway, he became king of the first king of all of unified Norway, as it was known back then, not necessarily the borders as we know it today, around the turn of the 10th century. Now, to do this, he had to win at a battle called Hafrsfjord, uh, which he did win in the end. And this actually caused a lot of Norwegian noblemen, earls and the like, who had been petty kings before the battle and had opposed Harald, and even some who fought with him because he was seen as being quite the tyrant to flee from Norway westwards and of course westwards from Norway that meant the Scottish Isles, Ireland, the Faroe Isles and importantly also Iceland but more about the settlement of Iceland later on. Now in this one I'm not entirely sure what Harold is going to be doing because of course the Great Heathen Army is around the middle of the 9th century which is around the time that Harold Fairhair was born. So, of course, the timelines are really quite skewed. Now, of course, you've got the terrible timing, historically at least, of Ragnar Lothbrok attacking Lindisfarne, which was in 793, and then being the brother of Rollo, the first duke, or Hrolf the Ganga, to call him in his Old Norse name, the first Duke of Normandy, who only became Duke of Normandy in 911 AD. So you see that there is a huge 
timeline shift and Vikings is incredibly lenient on datelines. So I honestly have no idea what they are going to show of Harald uh, becoming king of Norway. Now it's insinuated that to become king of all of Norway he has to first take over Kattegat which is of course the area which first Ragnar and now uh, Lagatha are ruling. But I initially thought that this place was in Denmark. It was insinuated that it was in Denmark. But uh, I'm not sure how that's going to play out if uh, Harald Fardhager is indeed going to take over um, Kassegat. It's it's possible. But honestly, the timelines are so blurred at this point. I, I would have no idea where they're going with that. But historically speaking, he did become the first king of Norway. So I guess we can expect to see him around for a bit longer in this season. Okay, so here I'm going to slow things down and just look at this still, which is, it shows quite a few things that annoy me about the conflict in Vikings. Now, first of all, is that while we do have one or two fairly accurate, fairly good shield wall battles, by far the most battles are just both sides running at each other and then having this kind of pell-mell spread out battle of just individual duels happening one at a time. This is incredibly inaccurate as both sides would want to stay in formation for as long as possible. If you've done any kind of video game like Mountain Blade or literally anything, one of the first things you learn is stick together and fight together. And that's because you can look after each other. The reason why the Vikings in this period and the Anglo-Saxons had round shields was so that they could interlock. Now of course you can do that with other forms of shields but the whole mode of fighting was so that you could not only protect your own body but also part of the guy next to you which is the basically the basis of having a shield wall in the first place. Now in this scene we quite clearly see there is no order whatsoever. Everyone is just going in one man for themselves which essentially means that the guys who are clever and work two or three at a time will just go through any single enemy that runs at them like this, but we hardly ever see that happen. Now the scene on the beach, if you remember in I believe season 1 where the Anglo-Saxons sort of run at them and the Norsemen uh, under Ragnar, um, they form a shield wall. Now that's exactly why forming a shield wall is such a good idea. Now in reality the Anglo-Saxons were also forming shield walls because this was the Germanic way of fighting at the time it, during this period. But we hardly ever see any of it and it confuses me because shield wall fights are really cool. I think The Last Kingdom does it very well actually where you see the kind of close knit um, of really just cheek by jowl kind of fighting. And being a reenactor myself who does shield wall fights and you might say well it's a lot more fun to have people running in and it's a lot more dramatic i tell you shield walls are scary to be a part of they can be really scary because you've got blades coming at you left right and center and interesting enough it's not the people that are opposite you that that kill you in a shield wall um obviously i haven't been killed but in reenacting you are killed quote unquote when you are hit um but for these guys they were killed it wouldn't be the guy opposite you it's the guys one or two guys down from the left you fight across the shield wall and not straight on um but I think The Last Kingdom did it very well and I think it's a shame that Vikings doesn't look more into kind of shield wall stuff but anyway moving on from my grievances about the lack of shield walls and shield wall fights in Vikings uh, we see the guy in the background here lifting up his shield above his body which is ridiculous because as you can see his whole underbody is now open to be jabbed and this is what I was saying about it wouldn't work because if there were simply two guys working together if one guy attacks him and he lifts his shield like that the other guy would simply plunge his weapon into his now completely open body which is really a ridiculous thing to do in a fight and I would also wonder why has he got his shield right the way up there the reason that shields were that big during the time was so that they could hold it at a similar angle and without having to actually move the shield they just tilt the shield to cover the part of their body again this is why people fought in shield walls so that they wouldn't need bigger shields so that because the other guy's shields to the left and right of them also blocked part of their body now I wonder what part of his block body is he blocking by putting his shield up like that it's simply ridiculous because it's so far away from his body 
That's one thing I noticed, and also because that's one of the reasons why it's stupid not to have them in shield walls. Secondly, the guy back there is running in uh, with a shield on his back, which is okay if he had a Dane axe, which was a very large kind of axe, which might be used outside of shield walls. There are accounts of these guys going at shield walls and just chopping up the shields to get a breach in the shield walls. But quite clearly, that is not a Dane axe. That is quite clearly a one-handed axe, albeit with a slightly larger uh, handle. But he is just charging in willy-nilly like that, and he has no protection. If there is anyone with a spear or anything even slightly longer than the hack of that axe, which doesn't look like it has a particularly long range, that man is dead. So again, just a few nitpicky points. I know some people were asking if I could do some accuracy in Vikings and the fight scenes and things. So I hope you have enjoyed that little bit there. Meanwhile, my favourite child of Ragnar's, Björn Ironside, seems to have returned to the desert. Now, in the last season, we saw, obviously, Björn and a few of the other guys going off to the Mediterranean, which I will assume is in reference to the trip that Björn Ironside took famously to the Mediterranean in 860 AD, which would slightly line up with the sort of vague mingled timeline of the Vikings universe. Now this was a very famous raid and it's actually during this time that the sort of idea of entering a city by pretending to die and then being buried and then coming out of the coffin actually comes from. Now, of course, in Vikings, it's Ragnar who pulls this off, and I believe it was season three or season four. When they're attacking Paris, they can't get in. Ragnar pretends he's died, and uh, so he gets into the city because he wants to be buried a Christian. And while he's being buried during the funeral, he breaks out of his coffin, shock horror. All the guys inside the city open the gate, the army comes in, and Bob's your uncle, the Vikings have taken another town. Now, actually, historically, this happened at the city of Luni, which is a city in Italy. Now, I'll probably butcher the Italian there, um, but it was essentially where Bjorn Ironside and his Mediterranean voyage was besieging the city. They couldn't get in. They'd already failed to attack another city, which was, I believe, Pisa, which they thought was Rome, but actually wasn't. But when they were besieging um, Luni, it was Bjorn and another leader called Hastein at the time. Hastein pretended he was deathly ill and had a last-minute deathbed conversion to Christianity, and he wanted to be buried inside the city. So the Christians, being the good, God-fearing men of God that they were, decided to let him into the city to be buried. And obviously, same thing happened as is shown in Vikings in Paris, but that actually happened in Italy where they let themselves in. And Bjorn returned very famous and very rich. Now, especially when I look at the next image here where you can see these kind of uh, eastern looking guys, these were the Moors. And I think there was, a, there was quite a big controversy actually during the last season about the whole kind of contact between Muslims and Vikings, which I think is an interesting topic, um, which I might make a separate video on. Again, I'm, I keep saying I'll make separate videos. I thought it might be good instead of promising to do loads of separate videos and then not actually doing them because I have such a horribly frantic life. Um, I might actually put a up and see which video which I have promised people would most like to see so don't forget to vote in that I might even do it now so just have a look and, and see which one you most want to see but I might do a video about Muslims and Vikings and what the truth behind their interaction was or at least in in my view in my um, readings etc but anyway, what we have to remember is that uh, obviously North Africa at this stage was Muslim. That was conquered by um, the Arabs at some point during, I think, sort of the uh, the around the 8th, 9th centuries, which obviously this is halfway through the 9th century. And it is actually at the start of the 8th century. I think 714 is the famous date of the battle, the name of which I've forgotten, um, where the Moors invaded Spain, which at that point was controlled by the Visigoths. And most of Spain at this stage was under Moorish rule. It was part of the kingdom of Al-Andalus, which is where we get the modern name of Andalusia from, which is the uh, autonomous region in the south of Spain at the moment. Um, and essentially most of Spain at this time was ruled by an Islamic class and a lot of people in the south were um, Islamic. Uh, so obviously speaking Arabic. Um, so that's sort of where these 
people are going. So you can see Bjorn obviously isn't making the best of friends with them, especially after the last season. But spoilers again, this will not end well for Bjorn. Actually, Bjorn gets out of it alive, but he returns to the Mediterranean. He returns to um, Moorish Spain. Uh, but he's met with a Moorish fleet and they use what was called Greek fire to attack them. Now, Greek fire is um, a kind of substance. It's called Greek because it was used by the Byzantines. I think they also used it on the um, the Rus at the time, who were the Swedish Vikings who attacked Constantinople at various points during this period before famously becoming the Varangian Guard and actually protecting the emperor, which is an interesting story in its own right. The Norse, uh, or should I say the uh, Scandinavians in the east, but essentially Bjorn Ironside is met by an, uh, a fleet, a Moorish fleet at the time, who uh, destroy many of his ships, although Bjorn gets away um, with the treasure and lives out his days an incredibly rich man in Scandinavia. So I think that's what we have to look forward to in regards to Bjorn's story. Now, returning back to England, this is obviously someone being ferried, um, we only see it for a very short amount of time, into some kind of swamp. Now, this might, in fact, be King Alfred. King Alfred is very famous in uh, Britain. He's called Alfred the Great. He's the only British ruler, or English ruler, I should say, to be called the Great at all, um, apart from arguably Knut, but I think Knut is called the Great by the Danes rather than the English. Um, but yeah, he is a very important figure at the time. And Alfred is essentially the guy who turns back the Danish invasion started by the Great Heathen Army. So you have the middle of 860, 865 is when the Danes arrive, 866 is when they take most of Northumbria, but not all, which is something that the, the Last Kingdom annoys me, because it calls Wessex the Last Kingdom, whereas in, in actual fact the northern half of Northumbria, Bernicia, um, which uh, I live across the river from Bernicia, um, that kingdom didn't actually fall to the Vikings that managed to stay independent as well right up until sort of the uh, I believe the middle of the 10th century when uh, Northumbria part of it became the kingdom of Jorvik which was the uh, a Norse kingdom around York but anyway that's something that annoys me but I might make a video about that as well so I think this could be King Alfred who I think it was in the middle of the 870s that he was attacked, a surprise attack on his royal court at Chippenham. He was forced to flee, and where did he flee? The Somerset Levels. So he famously fled to a place called Athelney, which was in the middle of this swamp, because he it was obviously it would be very difficult to find him there for the Danes, which it was. Now he stayed there for a while. This is where the famous story of Alfred burning the cakes that he was meant to be watching for a, a woman and then getting uh, told off by her because obviously he'd burn her cakes. And that's when this, this story happens. But eventually Alfred gets back on top. The people of uh, Somerset and Devon, Wiltshire, they, they rise up, they uh, raise the fjord and uh, they then together manage to defeat the Vikings in a great big battle at Ethendom or Eddingdon as it's called, uh, which was in 878, a uh, very important battle. And that, in fact, is the battle at the last the last episode of The Last Kingdom in the first season. That's the huge battle with the shield wall. And I think you'll agree with me, that shield wall battle was really cool, and I wish Vikings would do a few more like that. So potentially, yes, this will be King Alfred sort of foreshadowing, although th th that is um, about a decade after the other events that are being portrayed, sort of Bjorn's voyage to the Mediterranean, uh, coinciding with the rest of the Great Heathen Army attacking the Midlands, so Mercia, East Anglia, the Edmund stuff, uh, where Uber maybe played a role in Edmund's martyrdom. That's at least, you know, a good 10 years after that. But with Vikings timelines, you literally never know. So finally, and something that I think some people probably will already have theorized about, is the last shots of Floki now in this place. Now, I think many of you will already have theorized that this is Floki going to Iceland. And it's interesting because there was actually a character called Floki who did go to Iceland during this period. Now, the first of Norseman on Iceland was a man called Nadover, and he probably got there accidentally, but he is credited with the discovery of Iceland. Although it's actually a Swede by another name who got there first, or who got there second but stayed a little while. And I think it might be um, basing 
of his story that we get this floki storyline where he sets himself adrift to find it now i think the swede was blown off course and then he managed to get to iceland so he stayed there for a while and he was actually the one who first gave it a name which was snarland which um in old norse is snowland obviously later on this would become iceland rather than uh, Snowland because they found quite a lot of supermarkets on the island. Now there's another interesting theory which suggests that the, the Norse weren't actually the first, that it was Irish or Hiberno-Irish monks there, um, which is fairly plausible um, as the Irish monks at the time were looking for colonies in the footsteps of the Desert Fathers, although obviously there are uh, remarkably few deserts in Scotland and Ireland, so they would take the desert that they had, which was the sea, so you get places like Scarrick Michael um, in Ireland, which is essentially this big bare rock where they would go to become hermits, which is the Celtic Christian ideal. So it's possible there were already Irish monks here uh, called Papas at the time, although we're not entirely sure, and that they were then... Um, given a nice gruesome end by the Norse when they did actually arrive there in force. Um, but as I say, as I was saying, there is a Floki who um, was the first Norseman to deliberately sail to Iceland, and he was born in somewhere in the 9th century. So it's possible that, um, obviously, I have been theorizing that Floki was this Floki all along, uh, that that's why they called him um, that. And his, his nickname was indeed Rafna Floki, which is uh, Raven Floki. Uh, because he took three ravens with him to help him find Iceland and he uh, set up a winter camp in Iceland. Um, yeah, so essentially those are my predictions for what I think is going to happen in the next season, season five of Vikings. Now, these are predictions based on the history. You may or may not agree with them and what it is. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Um, sorry for not uploading for such a long time. I've been up and down the country to the two capitals of England, to both York and London. Um, and yeah, it's it's been hectic, but I'm going to try and upload more um, and maybe just some more content like this, which is a bit more just me talking because I can talk about history for hours on end. It's the uh, editing and the footage, that kind of thing that takes me a long time. So yeah, let me know if you are happy with me doing that or if you uh, want more nice visuals but anyway thanks very much for watching i'm history with Hilbert, and i will see you all again soon don't forget to like comment and subscribe